Hello, Ahmed. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good, good. Ahmed Naji, uh, you're independent art researcher, writer, and cultural consultant of modern and contemporary Iraqi art. You held executive and advisory roles in several institutions, like the Iraqi Memory Foundation in Baghdad from 2005 to 2008, and also the Humanitarian Dialogue Foundation in London between 2008 and 2011. I invited you to this uh, conversation to discuss your uh, book entitled Under the Palm Trees, Modern Iraqi Art with Mohammed Makia and Jawad Salim, published by Rizoli, New York in 2019. So to start this uh, conversation, I'd like you to explain us your methodology of uh, research for this book in terms of access to archives and sources. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having me on this platform. And it's very good to always speak to you and connect with you, uh, especially that I've known you before. I published the book yeah. when I was actually in the process of publishing the book. And uh, we share the same passion uh, in terms of archives and specifically Joa Selim, who is a, uh, a big protagonist uh, or a main protagonist in, in this book. So my book uh, revolves around um, the Iraqi art through a specific specimen, and this specimen is the private collection of the pioneer architect uh, Mohammed Makia. Yeah. And his, his collection, it's uh, unique in the sense uh, that um, it had access to uh, important or contains very important examples uh, of Iraqi art from the 1950s. And also the longevity of the uh, collection, because the collection uh, has a, a second phase of, uh, to it, that's from uh, 1986 until 2006, uh, due to the activity of the Kufa Gallery, which was a cultural center set up by uh, Makia. So the book relies very much on the um, books, publications, archives, information, and the collection itself. Uh, that comes from the Makia family. Uh, in addition to the references that we have from uh, books and publications on um, Iraqi art history. Yeah. So in your book, you wrote, Jawad Salim and Mohammed Makia were part of a generation searching for a new Iraqi identity suited to its time. Um, why is it interesting to uh, connect these uh, two figures of uh, Iraqi modern art and also modern time in Iraq? Yes, um, it is important to identify that um, in a time like this, so in 2020, next year 2021, um, is going to be 100 years on the modern nation of Iraq. The modern nation or the modern state uh, and the modern nation created by the state in 1921 yeah. and the role models who emerged from this uh, modern state uh, were Jawan Salim in terms of the art and Mohammed Maki in terms of uh, architecture and they were uh, they were at the forefront of a generation each within his field to look for this um, new identity of a Baghdad which was medieval in a sense under an Ottoman Empire and um, it did not have um, it did not have let's say the, the same um, institutionalized identity that you could see possibly uh, in the West in Europe or even some other countries, for example, Egypt. Yeah. And, and Maki and Joa Selim stand out uh, to be, and it's, it's, I specifically mention Maki and Joa Selim, that's because they, they are the focus of my research, but they are not the only ones. So here we're also talking about the generation that includes Opach Adachi, who is yeah. you know, a few years younger than them, um, Hamid Mehdi Jawahiri, who is a, a very important uh, poet, possibly the most important Arab poet, classical poet uh, specifically, 
Uh, and and other pioneers in different fields of you know medicine, sociology, like Ali Wardi, for example. But Maki and Jawasilin, they were, in a sense, you can see what they've created. Uh, they emerged from a medieval Baghdad into a modern Baghdad, and they helped shape this modern Baghdad and 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 the modernism that uh, uh, lived on, and we can still see. So, my focus on them is more to celebrate these two role models, to learn from them, and to reflect on what they have achieved uh, in this uh, new state, which next year is going to be a centenary. Yeah. Uh, can you introduce us to uh, Mohamed uh, Makia very briefly, like his education and his uh, career? Yes. So um, Mohamed Makia was born in the old Baghdad, um, which is roughly the same Abbasid Baghdad, the same alleyways. You can trace them historically uh, to, to the old uh, Abbasid Baghdad uh, in uh, Rasafa in 1914, roughly around 1914. We, we are not exactly sure of the date, but this is what comes in his uh, documentation. Uh, and he was, a family, uh, he was born an orphan uh, from a middle-class family uh, that valued education and uh, he was supported by his uncle from his mother's side um, to study. And then in the uh, 1930s, early 1930s, uh, he was part of uh, a number of uh, gener a number of people who were identified by the Iraqi government at the time uh, under King Faisal I, uh, who set up the government, as I said, in 1921 to send them to scholarships, on scholarships to study in the West. So Makia, for example, went to study architecture in uh, Liverpool in the 1930s. And around the same time, Jawa Selim was also sent on a scholarship to study art in Paris uh, and Italy. And uh, Makia uh, went to a high school, which was um, the, uh, the most uh, notable a high school in, in Baghdad at the time, uh, and the most established one is called Al Adadi Al Markaziyya, um, where also Jawa Salim studied, and several artists like Hafal al um se several uh, people, even let's say uh, doctors, engineers, who are you know from that generation, they went through that high school. Uh, although Makia is five years older than Jawad, he he did not know him personally when he was when they were both in Iraq. No. Makia connected with Jawa Salim in 1938 when he was studying in Liverpool um, uh, because they had some common friends. These common friends were some architects who were older than Makia by a year or two. Mithat Ali Madlum, Saeed Ali Madlum, and Jafar Alawi, who knew Jawa Salim at the time. Jawa Salim, on the other hand, was born 1919 in, uh, in Turkey because his father was a, an officer in the Ottoman. Uh, army at the time, and he was stationed in, in Turkey. And then the family moved to Baghdad. His father is Mohammed Salim al Baghdadi. Um, and Jawa Salim uh, grew up uh, in a, a very famous, you know, historic uh, artistic family uh, because we know their father was also used to paint and draw part of his you know, military training. Uh, and we know that um, his elder brother, Suad Salim, yeah. uh, the first Iraqi artists uh, at the time. Uh, and then his younger brothers are uh, Nazar Salim and Naziha Salim. And Makia and Jawa Salim, they connected in Paris, 1938. That's when they first met. And according to uh, Makia, that uh, Jawa Salim left uh, a very profound impression on um, Hamad Makia. Yeah. And, when Makia went back to uh, Iraq, he went back to Iraq after finishing uh, or completing his PhD in architecture at Cambridge University. And his PhD in Cambridge University allowed him to explore in a much uh, wider sense uh, the uh, common themes in architecture between different civilizations, uh, yeah. different cultures, that are in the vicinity of the Mediterranean. Mm. Um, and, his, and that gave him a sort of a, 
encyclopedic knowledge of the different forms of architecture, different cultures, different historic periods, but also give, gave him a, um, a holistic view and a larger philosophical lens uh, to understand art and to understand architecture and yeah. for Mohammed Makia later on. Um, and this is in the mid 50s, uh, towards the end of the 50s, he was considering, maybe he did not you know, specify it at the time, but later on we know from his memoirs, he, would, he considered architecture to be the mother of all arts, like philosophy is the mother of all science. Yeah. And we, we saw that uh, in 1956, uh, when the Iraqi Artists Association was founded, uh, that Joa Salim and the other artists uh, elected Mohammed Makia to be their first president who was an architect. Mm -hmm. uh, by all means, he was an architect who did not uh, produce any kind of art apart from architecture. So here we're distinguishing Makia as an architect from other architects who were artists. Uh, for example, Qahtan al Matfai, who was part of the Society Primitive uh, Al Rawad uh, Group 1950 with Faiq Hassan. Or another architect who was famous for his documentary photography, like Rafat Chadarchi. Uh, but here we can see that uh, Makia, because of his um, encyclopedic knowledge, uh, a good standing in the society, um, and he was also the first person to have a PhD in architecture in Iraq, to the point where it was difficult for him to find a job uh, because he was overqualified for most jobs. Uh, and he mentions even in, in his uh, memoirs. Yeah. that when he met one of the highest ranking government officials, they said to him, why do you have a PhD in architecture? Where are we going to employ you? You know, we have no jobs for you. So he worked for a few years in planning. Uh, there was a department for planning, yeah. urban planning. So he worked there as an urban planner uh, before uh, setting up his own uh, architectural office. And then uh, towards uh, 19, towards the end of the 1950s, uh, he founded the Department of Architecture within the University of Baghdad. There was no Department of Architecture before Mohammed Miki. Uh, therefore, Mohammed Miki, you can see, is also one of these you know, generations of the, of the first. So he's the first president of the Iraqi Artists Association, 1956. He is the first president of, or the head of the Architecture Department, which is newly founded. Uh, 1959, uh, University of Baghdad. His architectural office with uh, Midhat Ali Madlum and another architect, Henry Zbogda, uh, was in 19, I think 1963, was the first gallery, a uh, private gallery in Baghdad. It was known as Al Wasati. Mm. And we know what Al Wasati means to both Mohammed Miki and Jawa Sini. Um And Jawa Sini that, that was their common task, you mean, yeah. Exactly, yes. And uh, Jawad Salim, on the other hand, was also one of you know, these generations of the first because he's, after he finished uh, or his study was interrupted in uh, Paris in, in Italy because of World War II, when he went back to uh, Baghdad, uh, he became the head of the uh, sculpture department uh, within the Institute of Fine Art. Here we're talking Institute of Fine Art uh, and the Institute of Fine Art was founded in 1936. Yeah. The uh, painting department was founded in 1939 uh, by Faiq Hassan. There was no sculpture department. Then sculpture department was uh, founded soon after, I think in 1940. Uh, and Joa Selim was the, the first head of department, of sculpture department, uh, so to speak. Yeah. And then we see later on that also Joa Selim became, here we can see this is one of his last pictures yeah. with his uh, monument, the Freedom Monument, where Joa Selim uh, became the first Iraqi artist to be commissioned by an Iraqi government to do the first public monument in, in Baghdad in that sense. The monuments that preceded this were uh, imperialist equestrian uh, monuments, um, for example, of uh, King Faisal I on a, you know, on a horse, uh, General Stanley Maud on a horse. Both of these were torn down in uh, the morning of the revolution, 14th of July, 1958. 
and there was a uh, another uh, monument or a statue of a notable politician, Abdul Mahsin Saadun. However, that statue, I let, you know, this is something I found out actually after I published my book, yeah. uh, that the, the statue was commissioned by his family, uh, Mahsin, Abdul Mahsin Saadun's family. Mm. Yes. So here you can see that both Makia and Joa Salim, they collaborated in a way, whether directly or indirectly, consciously or unconsciously, but they were part of that generation uh, which had massive opportunities at the same time, massive challenges, because they were uh, the first in terms of you know, new fields uh, that were not established by other people before them. Before them, yeah. So you just talked uh, about uh, medieval Baghdad. Um, so this is the third chapter of your book. And you, you wrote... Um, uh, both Mesopotamian and Islamic art were neglected and overlooked for centuries as Iraq was under the control of the Ottoman Empire for four centuries. Uh, can you walk us through uh, this uh, medieval uh, Baghdad and tell us like, how was the Islamic heritage integrated in the urban landscape in the beginning of the 20th century? So, um, during the Abbasid times, um, obviously the, the Abbasid uh, empire started with the foundation of the city of Baghdad, which, which became their capital. And we know the round city of, Mansour, uh, the round city of uh, Baghdad, built by Abu Ja'far al-Mansur, uh, was on the Karkh side, which is the left bank of Tigris. And then it uh, was destroyed and then uh, some of the Abbasid caliphs, uh, I think seven caliphs, uh, founded a new capital in Samarra. That's where you can see the spiral minaret. And then after that, they moved back to uh, Baghdad and they set up a new um, Abbasid city on the Rasafa side, which is the right side of the, of the Tigris. And uh, very much that the architecture and the, the mapping of, this, of the city the foundation of the city comes from that Abbasi time. Uh, and, and some of these uh, um, artifacts or historical buildings that uh, remain uh, were not in uh, a, a great shape. And uh, they were not, uh, for example, looked after by the people um, in an institutionalized way because our understanding of heritage is something that is, in a sense, very modern, it's very late. Yeah. Um, one example of this is Al Khulafa Mosque, uh, specifically uh, the minaret that we see here. Yeah. Makia was born uh, about 100 meters away from this minaret. And this minaret is known according to the market that is uh, next to it. The market is called Souq al Ghazi, which was a, a market where you would buy animals like pets, specifically pets. So you can you can find anything from a parrot to a pet snake. Uh, to, uh, so it was a novelty uh, market, something very uh, nice. And it's uh, still uh, available until today, still standing until today. And this minaret was known according to the market. Historical research during 1950s uh, onwards, and this is uh, explored in a book published by Mohammed Makia and other historians in 1968. It's called Baghdad, and yeah. it was funded by the Goldman Khan Foundation. In that book, it was established that uh, this minaret, which is known after the market, possibly comes from a private mosque of one of the late Abbasid caliphs. So the Abbasid caliphs uh, quarters used to be in that region, and there was a mosque, a small private mosque, uh, uh, attached to his quarters, and this possibly was the minaret of that mosque. And then uh, the Iraqi government was interested in, in this in the 1960s. Um, so 1959 until 63, they, uh, the Iraqi government uh, commissioned Hamid Makia to propose uh, a building or to propose a, uh, a new mosque uh, to refurbish this minaret, which we can see that it survived from uh, the 1200 or 1300 
uh, until the 1960s, to refurbish it and to propose a mosque to it. And here, Mohammed Makia was uh, against a, a great challenge uh, for him uh, professionally, but at the same time, it is something that, uh, it is a challenge that uh, he saw would give him the opportunity to channel all his uh, expertise and knowledge and um, his historic knowledge uh, of the architecture in, in, uh, in Baghdad specifically. And he proposed a, a majestic something, you know, it, it was a large scale design uh, for it. However, uh, the irony of these things is that the government only gave him a very modest plot of land around the minaret because the minaret was surrounded by houses. So the government had to buy these you know, small houses um, to get it. So, so Mohammed Makia was very frustrated and uh, he, uh, there is a quote from him, he says, uh, they were expecting me to build a cathedral on a, a very small uh, plot of land. Um, so, but then what that pushed him to is that he used uh, modern uh, structural methods in terms of uh, uh, steel and concrete uh, with uh, local material uh, known for uh, architecture in Baghdad, which is the uh, mud brick, it's the baked brick yeah. uh, 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 to use it. And he used, he fused these two together. So he fused the modern concepts uh, in, in terms of the structure with the exterior or let's say the finish of the uh, of the building uh, to still capture the spiritual aspect of the the mosque and he used for that aspect uh, he used uh, master builders uh, known as osta uh, these master builders these are uh, uh, local craftsmen uh, who inherited the way of building the houses in uh, the a very, uh, let's say, a traditional way that possibly you can trace it back to the Abbasids as well. Yeah. So, so he used, you know, local craftsmen uh, to use this mud. And in this building, what you can see, you can see the embodiment or, you know, the, an example uh, of his architectural theory uh, known as uh, uh, the, the, the human... Uh, theory of architecture, where he would consider three factors that you have to satisfy in every design. Uh, and I would briefly just tell you what his architectural theory, and you'll see there are so many parallels between it and the Baghdad Modern Art Group ethos, for example. So, Mohammed Makia, in every building, he would consider the temporal factor, the time factor. Yeah. He would consider the building has to be a continuity of the past into uh, the present, but with enough innovation to look into the future. So in other words, uh, it means that the, the building should not be a point of departure and uh, it should not be, let's say, a dichotomy from the past. It should be a continuity from the past, yeah. but also a point of involvement. Uh, in terms of the um, spatial factor or the, you know, factor of the space. The special factor is that the building should emerge from the landscape of its surroundings and should not be imposed on it, neither should it be uh, very uh, flat in a way that it blends in unnoticed. So therefore his scale for any of these works and we, can, we saw uh, after the Khulafa Mosque in several mosques and several projects he did, it's not only mosques, uh, that you know, his scale starts from the human scale and then it gets larger until you create some sort of a monument. The moment, yeah. on the mm. And the final factor is equal to the human factor. This factor is about a function, is that how can you uh, optimize function in a space? So, for example, a mosque, uh, people would associate a mosque with worship, uh, and for example, the Friday fra uh, prayers. Mm -hmm. Go to a church on Sunday, you go to a Kinesit on a Saturday, you would go to a mosque on a Friday. Friday. However, Makia sought to uh, revive the mosque not only as a, uh, a place of prayer, but also as a cultural center. Because uh, in medieval times, 
Mosques were the places where people were studying language, history, poetry, uh, and it was not only for uh, worshipping. Yeah. Where people celebrate Eid, uh, you know, they get together on, on Ramadan. So these are, they have social functions in addition to the religious function. And this is what he tried to do with the Khalafa Mosque, although it is very, very small, but he can extrapolate that because this was his starting point, his turning point in his architecture. Uh, you can extrapolate that to other projects where he did successfully, like the State Mosque in Kuwait and the Sultan Qabus Mosque in Oman, in, in Masqa. Um, so, so here uh, you have this, let's say, monument created by Mohammed Mekie, uh, which you can visit in Baghdad now, and you can see this is a picture from 2018. And you can see the, the mosque basically is... Uh, in harmony with its environment, in harmony with its surrounding. At the same time, it has all these spiritual elements that you would expect from a, a historic medieval place, but it is very much a modern design uh, because of the, uh, the, the way the space is created and the technology that went into it the, um, you know, the, uh, in terms of uh, architect in terms of uh, concrete and uh, the steel beams, etc. Yeah, yeah. So you just mentioned um, this uh, notion of uh, continuity from the past to the present. Uh, there's uh, another references um, for, especially Jawad uh, Salim, um, a reference, uh, historical references from uh, the 13th century. Uh, from the Abbasid uh, times, uh, which is uh, the manuscript of Al Maqamat by Al Hariri, uh, no, sorry, by uh, Yahya Al Wasiti from the 13th century. Can you explain us, like, how? So, you, you mentioned with uh, Mohammed Makia and the Khulafa Mosque, how Jawad Salim reconnect to this uh, historical uh, and cultural heritage? Yes, um, so as we mentioned that Baghdad is an Abbasid uh, creation, yeah. and what uh, Mohammed Maki and his generation looked at in terms of um, material culture, in terms of creativity, uh, things that were produced as well in the same uh, Abbasid times and what was uh, produced thereafter, what survived from them is these magnificent works of uh, Yahya al-Wasati, who was a, a 13th century uh, miniature painter and a, a, a very important copy of this maqamat is in the National Library in, in uh, Paris. Yeah. Uh, and what Maki and Jawas saw is that al-Wasati is an important role model for them to start to investigate as their, their point of um, uh, inspiration and as their first point of, uh, let's say, an access point to uh, Islamic heritage yes. in, terms, in terms of art. Mm -hmm. So for example, in this specific example of uh, Hariri, what you can see, you can see both art and architecture in it. The yeah. art in the way that the scene is composed in the different tones that are applied. And if you can see, all of these tones are very much are earthen in, in their uh, palette. It's, a, it's an earthen palette, which is a very important point to specify here because you see that also in the works of Jawa Salim from the 1950s. And also this earthen color on these brown tones uh, make a distinctive mark in the work of Faiq Hassan uh, as well. At the same time, you see architecture. So you see the repetition of the arches at the top. You yeah. see the dome and the proportion of the dome to the minaret. And the way uh, it is, uh, uh, let's say, forming the landscape. Uh, at the same time, it, it's like a culmination of this uh, structure. So you, the structure in this painting, for example, is starting from the human scale at the bottom of the painting. And then that human scale is repeated and enlarged. And with the repetition, you get another concept of Islamic geometry. 
and then the culmination of that it becomes into sort of oneness um, uh, exemplified in the dome at yeah. the top of the, of the of the painting so there are so many things that you can read from this work of al wasati alone that imagine in the 1950s when maki and joa salim and their and their generation who trained in the west they went back and they were looking for something local obviously this would be a very rich source so for example uh, the domes of mosques in Iraq are specifically uh, blue or uh, some sort of a turquoise to green blue, different uh, tones of uh, blue. And this was a question uh, that architecturally posed itself in the 1950s. And according to Khalid al Qassab and according to um, uh, Mohammed Maki as well, that and Joa Salim, that for example, the reason this color was chosen for the dome of the mosque, because this is reflecting the sky, and therefore the dome is like the point of connection. It is like your USB yeah. to connect to the sky. Uh, which, yeah. and, then, and then we see that this object also actually made its way in 1980s to the other important monument, possibly the most important postmodern monument in Iraq, which is not a shaheed by the martyr's monument by Ismail Fattah al-Turk, um, where they have chosen also uh, this color for, for these domes. So al wasati here stands out as the nearest link to these modern masters in terms of accessing their heritage. And what lies beyond the Islamic heritage is the Mesopotamian heritage, which was during the 1950s was still being discovered. Yeah. During the 1950s, uh, the uh, Iraqi artists, they did not have, let's say, very wide access as we now have, or very good knowledge as we now have of Mesopotamian uh, archeology span and Mesopotamian heritage, uh, because the excavation works were still ongoing and the museums uh, were still being developed. Yeah. And in fact, Shakir Hassan, Jawa Salim, uh, even Mohammed Makiya had more access to Mesopotamian heritage outside Iraq than okay. inside Iraq, yes. Mm. So in, uh, in, a pre in, pre in a previous conversation that I had with uh, Organi Fedova, we talked about uh, these um, these uh, Iraqi students uh, who traveled to the USSR during the 50s and 70s, um, but as you said, like even before, some Iraqi artists traveled to Europe uh, to complete their uh, their studies in institutions in Paris, Rome, and, or London, um, and back to their countries, they started forming collective or groups of uh, artists, like as you said uh, previously in 1941, uh, the Friends of Art Society was uh, founded. Why the creation of artist uh, associations was important in the birth of a local artistic scene and what was their aspirations? Um, this is a very uh, interesting question. And uh, it's very important as well to the understanding of the uh, Iraqi art movement uh, in the art scene. And at the same time, this is also the main theme of the study. Uh, if you look at different publications on uh, Iraqi art history and their movement, they look at jama'at, yani the art groups, and they study them. Uh, even some of these groups, for example, they only had one exhibition. They are still noted as a group, and they would have a manifesto. Uh, and you know, they would be mentioned. And the Friends of the Art Society stands out as the first sort of collective. It is not a, an art group like the other art groups that uh, uh, followed in 1950, 1951, uh, but it was the first collective of the artists uh, together. And as you can see here in the center of the group is Abdel Qadir Rassam, who was an um, you can call him an amateur painter, uh, although he was you know, very skilled, but as in there was no such profession as to be a, a painter per se uh, and qualify and to study as a, as a painter. Abdul Qadir Rassam, to his right, is uh, um, uh, Shukat al-Khafaf, 
and to his left is Mohammed Salim Al Baghdadi. Yeah. Uh, the three of them, uh, they are uh, an example of the generation of artists who trained in the Ottoman army, yeah. and part of their military training was to learn to paint and to draw uh, in the European style. And in 1941, what happened? So here in 1941, this is 20 years. Uh, so this is a second decade into the uh, Iraqi state. Yeah. And in 1941, the artists sought, uh, or they wanted to uh, collectively work together and to hold an exhibition. And I'm still looking deeper into this to see beyond the narrative. And it is interesting to note that in 1940, for example, so possibly a few months before this collection, there was an important exhibition of Polish artists who were stationed in Iraq during World War II. And in 1941, uh, the, the first collection of paintings uh, owned by the state, by the government, was established as part of the Museum of Archaeology. And we only know this because of a catalog, it's called the National Gallery of Pictures, 1941, thanks to Dr. Nada Shabot and um, the other people who worked with her on the Modern Art Iraq Archive, that we have a digital copy of this, which lists 65 paintings. Some of these paintings shows work by Abdel Qadir Rassam, uh, Half of the Rawi, uh, Atta Sabri, Faiq Hassan, uh, Joel Salim, for example, was not part of this you know, national collection. Yeah. And there were other works of uh, English uh, artists and Polish artists within this first, which is the nucleus national collection of art uh, in Iraq. 1941, uh, Friends of Art Society was the first, let's say, official uh, collective of these artists to recognize that we are part of the society, we are modern, we use painting yeah. and art specifically uh, to uh, express ourselves, to show uh, there is a, a modern approach uh, to life. However, this group was not sophisticated in terms of having a manifesto. It was a collective. So as you can see, for example, in the red uh, rectangle at the top, yeah. These are architects, the young architects who were friends of Makia in Liverpool who introduced him to Jawa Salim. Uh, they are Saeed Ali Madlum, Ja'far Allawi, and Mithat Ali Madlum. Uh, and as you can see in the bottom row, we have in the uh, black uh, square, yeah. it's the Jawa Salim, and next to him is Atta Sabri, and then next to him is half of the Ruby. So th this was the group that would lead later on uh, to these artists to form their own groups. And there are some Iraqi historians uh, who would argue that one of the reasons why this Friends of the Art Society was collected, or you know, let's say it was formed, was also due to the fact that Fayyad Hassan started teaching at the uh, Institute of Fine Art. And as you know, with any uh, institutional, uh, or let's say educational institution, that this educational institution would soon create its own community. So Faiq Hassan was in a way influencing this, maybe indirectly. He joined this group uh, in 1942. He did not join in 1941. And the, uh, this group, I think, uh, had a few sporadic exhibitions. They were annual exhibitions, annual group exhibitions until 1946. 